So here we are, we're talking about uh, programming, largely television programming. We're going to double back and talk about radio programming uh, and then move ahead, talk about TV programming, and also mix in there a little bit of information about cable TV um, because it's come up already as to what's you know, what's up with those, what they call cable TV networks, which actually are just cable TV channels that call themselves networks and such. The other thing is today is the 14th of February, which means that in two weeks on February 28th, our first research paper is due. And I have open here the research paper assignment, uh, the prompt. And uh, there is also a, uh, another little thing, which is the general information about the guidelines for research papers. So that's just four to six pages in length, double space, 12 points. Citation, basically, if you're citing the textbook, it is very simple. You just put the names of the author and the page number that you're citing. If you're citing other resources, we would like you to use the APA format. And we're actually going to the library on February 28th, the day this is due. We're going there to uh, have an orientation with the library and uh, some instructions about how to search beyond the textbook, which is not required for this essay. But uh, it, uh, you are welcome to search beyond the textbook if there's more information you want. Anyhow, on the 28th, uh, the librarian will uh, show us how to do some good searching uh, from good sources and then how to cite those sources in APA. So, you know, that can all be whipped together on February 28th, but what can't be whipped together is what you want to say in this essay and, uh, um, you know, the topic you're going to choose. You have four possible topics to choose from. And there they are. And uh, okay, that's up there. Four possible topics to choose from. Um, we have written these little discussions that we've been engaging in weekly. We we have written on these topics. So if you participated in those discussions, you already probably have something to say. You could also look at what other people say. It might be great, it might give you some good ideas. Down here at the bottom, um, okay, that's where the guidelines are. Um, yeah, so look over those prompts. And I did email out to everybody uh, a, uh, a link to another lecture where I really went through each of those things in great detail. Can email it out later or put it onto uh, this, this thing here. Um, however, uh, the one that we're working on uh, and that we discussed on Tuesday, which uh, you could still participate in the online discussion on the same topic here, uh, is uh, <coughs> regarding programming strategy. So that connects with our topic for this week. And uh, a lot of people write very good work on this. We had some great ideas coming up in class, last class as well, uh, regarding you know uh, putting ourselves in the place of a smaller network like the Fox or the CW. Fox is, <laughs> it once was smaller. Uh, just thinking about what strategies they used in order to break into the network television business given that ABC, CBS, and NBC were so dominant. And uh, a couple of ideas that we brought out that you could follow up were, you know, they started small. They, they programmed, for instance, Fox started on a Sunday night only, which was really dead time for ABC, CBS, NBC. They started out um, only programming one, one evening uh, and then built it out from there. So that was one thing. They you know, strategically looked at where the other networks weren't putting in much. Uh, on Sundays, 60 Minutes was the best rated show of the night always. So that's a news documentary show. Uh, what did Fox do? They did what we call counter-programming. 
They uh, brought out variety. They brought out The Simpsons began as a, a small segment on the Tracy Ullman show. Uh, so, so they picked uh, pretty cheap stuff to produce, and they went very young. You know, they, they focused in on very young audiences. Very young. Not little kids, but I mean, compared to CBS, ABC, and NBC, which were going for, you know, people 50 years old about. If Fox, you know, starts shooting for people in their 20s and 30s, and uh, that's another part of the strategy. So all of those things could be followed up and expanded upon, and uh, as I said, Wikipedia is a good place to start if you want to work on this particular topic. So any questions about this? Still two weeks away, but believe me, it comes up on you fast, and you know, it does take some thinking and some planning to do this. I see no questions. Excellent. So we will continue on with programming. And uh, as I said, let's double back into radio programming, OK? And you know, as we know, historically, uh, uh, television programming grew out of radio stuff. And so back in the early days of radio, we've said this before too, um, each radio network programmed quite a diverse a set of shows including, you know, comedies, dramas, music shows, and stuff like that. And all mixed up together and probably all different, you know, there'd be a classical music show on the same network channel, there'd be, uh, you know, popular music, of course, there'd be a lot of singers and such. You'd have live orchestras that actually were employed by the networks. Uh, and so they had all kinds of stuff all grouped together which is obviously not the way that modern radio programming works. Um, so what we do also know historically is that when television emerged as the new dominant medium in the 1950s, it took the stars, it took the, the popular uh, radio dramas and comedies and put them all on television, leaving radio kind of you know, dry. dry. Not much there, right? But as the cliche goes and the slide says, rock and roll saves radio uh, as they realize that um, they can get good audiences by playing recorded music with a DJ and that doesn't cost much compared to having, you know, what they used to do, variety shows, actors, dramas, famous people. So it becomes the new thing to do on radio is um, with um, play, play pre-recorded music and, and have uh, DJs do it. And so out of that, uh, in the 60s and 70s, you get into uh, what we call now format radio. Um, and uh, you know, up until the, the latest challenge to radio that we've discussed as well from streaming music services and stuff. But uh, if you look at you know, music or talk radio from the 60s on to the present day, um, it's basically sorted itself into particular formats. So we know that news and information is doing well. Uh, it hasn't been hit by the music streaming uh, services, which have taken a lot of audience away from music formats. Uh, Non-commercial radio is also doing well. KQED would be one of the highest rated radio stations, you know, just after KOIT in this, in this market if, uh, if they actually participated in the commercial ratings game, which they don't. But it is possible to estimate the listenership. So they do really well, actually, in terms of radio stations. Um, so looking at how music is organized, uh, into different formats. Uh, there's close to 40 formats that are currently used in the United States. Uh, it's a choice that a station, a local station will make. I mean, if it's owned by a larger group, then they will make that business decision as to what format a radio station plays. Uh, the license from the FCC doesn't confine you to any format. Okay? If you're a commercial station, you can pick what you want to do. Uh, you're not, you don't have to sign up to be a country station and forever stay a country station. In fact, uh, with some frequency, uh, stations flip and change their, uh, their, uh, their identity, basically, 
change their format. Um, so there's up there, you know, a list of, of formats. Country is still the top format in the United States. Um, yeah, out of about 10,000 radio stations, commercial radio stations, you know, there's close to 1,000 of them are country stations. Um, and, you know, I think that is arranged pretty much in, uh, eh, I don't know about that. Where to go for this type of information is, um, if you are interested in more of this, it is uh, Radio Today. It's now from, I guess, Nielsen is NIE. Now they call it audio today. All right, so Nielsen bought Arbitron, which used to do the radio ratings. So now Nielsen covers both television and radio. And like the Nielsen the boxes? They, yep, that's, they call them the Nielsen ratings, and it's the Nielsen company that uh, puts those boxes into people's uh, uh, homes. Yeah, am I going to have to? Yeah, you always have to do this. They don't like giving stuff away. Family Guy did an episode on them. Did you? Family Guy did. Oh, Family Guy, yes. I know that. Peter's doing his thing. Let me just see. Are there, all of these are required? Oh, my God. So, uh, teacher. This is a bore. They want my phone number? Just give them the schools. Yeah. Well, I can have mine too, I guess. I've done this before. California. This is probably last year I had to fill this in. Are we done here? Industry. Education? No. Media and entertainment? Yeah. Let's promote myself. Please tell us more. No, we don't need this. Submit. Did I get everything? Oh, right. So click on download. Where? Click on the link. Where is that link? Links. Oh, oh, it's up at the top. No, it's in the green. Download now. Oh. Here it comes. It takes a little arrow, what right? Is this again? So this is a report. This is the actual latest information about the broadcasting. Oh, it's like, okay. So this is, this is what Nielsen gives away for free uh, to folks like us. And I don't think my download actually worked. Well, so it's, what's been, so like, it's like an audio file? And just no, it's a, it's a report. Okay. But um, they don't just let you click on a web page and do what you want to do. What is going on? Oh, it's like statistics. Uh, it's much more fun than that, actually. It gives you maps. If, if, uh, and let me just see if I may have just the old copy, which I could have just. Let me just uh, search. Audio today. Listen.com. That's a website. Oh Lord! So I mean, I I obeyed, folks. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Oh, I'm just clicking on the wrong That's thing, the and there it is. On. Here we go. Oh well, just be more forthcoming. Um, let's have a look at what they're telling us here. E-commerce sites. AM, FM radio, across generations, ethnicities, and demographics. Reaches 95% of millennials, 97% Gen X, 98%. So they claim, you know, pretty, pretty extensive coverage. 94% of radio listeners tune to a network affiliated station every week as well. Interesting. Um, podcasting on the way up. That's kind of cool. However, I think this is what we were looking for just right now, right? Okay, well, those are podcasts. Let's top formats, right? By total listening. Now are we talking radio? All right, so countries on top, news talk second, news talk third, adult contemporary. So that would be what you hear on KOIT, sort of ballads and, uh, you know, mellow stuff, pop contemporary hit radio, so that would be heavy rotation, current pop songs, classic rock for old people, um, and classic hits. So that gives you a sense at least of what the current ones that are um, particularly listened to are. 
Um, so. Can you bring my glasses? Was wrap like, up there? Uh, that would be a, um, uh, what do they call it? Urban contemporary there would fall oh. under that. Rhythmic contemporary would be like R&B. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what rap stands for? Is that a question about what I'm talking about? No. no. Just, OK. Tied into the, uh, because they call it <laughs> urban contemporary, rap actually stands for something. Oh. It's rhythm and poetry. Oh, OK. Yeah. Interesting. So urban contemporary uh, stands for music for African-American audiences. Basically, when they say urban, that's how the industry kind of it's, it's codes coded that. It's coded language. It's coded language, yeah. <laughs> Our old professor, Cecil Hale, who was, he retired now, but he had a course called Race and Media, and he charted the whole history of all this. And, uh, you know, the, at a certain point, they started calling it urban contemporary. But, um, you know, there was, it was a racially segregated radio and popular music. Does and that class still exist? It doesn't. We, we when, when Dr. Hale left, they oh. did, but it was a fantastic class. Yeah, I guess. sounds like it. I sat in on it a couple of times. It was really good. Um, all right, so uh, yeah. What we know now is you know, particular stations set up under formats. Um, the reason they do that is because each format gathers a slightly different demographic of the audience. As you know, we were talking about, the urban contemporary uh, channels are, are designed to reach African-American audiences. It doesn't mean that people who love that music of any other ethnicity wouldn't also listen to those stations. But, you know, when Nielsen does all the ratings with all the samples and, and you know, they basically are checking out what everybody is listening to, um, they filter or, you know, uh, they have categories of different audience members. And so they, they know that, you know, People of whatever age will be listening to, you know, adult contemporary or your classic hits, your classic rock is likely to reach older people. Um, and so, you know, obviously you listen to the music that you like, but once they look at it broadly, statistically, uh, each of these formats attracts a, a different slice of the audience. And so um, if we, uh, The heck was I? Was it? I guess it was in the browser that I was looking at stated uh, audio today. If you dig further down into, um, where are we here? I changed the formatting of a lot of this stuff. Let's just see. Eh, they don't give us a lot that they used to give us. Um, all right. Well. Uh, they used to give us more, basically. Uh, for each of these formats, they would uh, break down the audience in terms of um, name, uh, um, uh, age, ethnicity, uh, where they listen. And then they would combine in with this additional information for marketing and stuff like that. So let me just make sure. They have actually had one of those. It's okay. Um, I guess it it basically fleshed out what we could you know guess by looking at this stuff, which was uh, you know classic hits, classic rock will pull. An older audience, classic rock, slightly more male, uh, you know, peaking at around 50 years old or so, versus pop contemporary hit radio will, you know, work with pretty much balanced across the different ethnic categories that they uh, look at, but much younger. And, and uh, adult contemporary tends to draw more of a female audience. And uh, so, you, can, you know, each of these pulls in a slightly different demographic group. And that's why they exist, basically. Um, they have emerged as each individual station tries to differentiate from the others. So if you've got like 40 state, excuse me, 40 stations in uh, San Francisco, you, you know, they're going to basically uh, uh, 
compete too heavily for the available advertising dollars if they all focus in on one or two of those formats. And so they diversify, they go you know, out into different formats, and um, uh, yet there are still certain logics, um, like um, uh, Clear Channel, uh, which is now iHeartRadio, um, they invested heavily into uh, urban contemporary, and so if you look at what they do, uh, for their older listeners, they've got KISQ. For a sort of middle middle age list, uh, area, they've got KMEL. Uh, in younger listeners, they got KYLD. Um, all of them playing, you know, uh, just a, um, a, uh, a coherent I, game where, you know, what they do hope is people listening to KYLD will eventually graduate to KMEL and eventually graduate to KISQ if you want. They hope to keep their listeners with them uh, through each of those stations. Um, so you can see some, some uh, strategy there based on just picking the formats of the stations. Um, and the, the, only, the other strategy to talk about is simply that you know, they try to stay out of each other's way. Uh, there may be several you know, classic hits stations in the Bay Area or classic rock. Um, they, you know, there's not 20 of them. Because that they would simply, you know, the advertisers would be drained by a few of them, and the rest would not make any money. Typically, the top two, three stations in any market take most of the advertising dollars. So that gives an incentive to the other stations to move around and um, uh, program a different format that isn't so heavily uh, competed. So. By, by, breaking, by breaking the uh, radio into different formats, it allows more, you know, more people to prosper. Because if there was you know, everyone doing just one format, then you, know, the, the, you, you couldn't have as effective an ad sales regime, basically. Uh, I don't know if all this is coming out that well. Here, let's talk about another thing in radio programming. Um, and this is not about what your station, how your station formats. This is how your station decides uh, what to play when. Uh, so this is called a hot clock, these circles. Um, they are generated within computers now. So if you're a commercial radio station, you probably have a whole package of uh, automation based in computers. Your DJs play all the songs that are on these uh, uh, digital libraries. Uh, this helps you organize your hour of programming. So uh, the clock represents 60 minutes. And uh, so, you know, this would be, find my best pen, pen up here. here we go, this is excellent. So this would be your top of your hour, like let's say 8 a.m. starts there, 8.15, 8.30, 8.45, okay. And as you can see, uh, the clock would be different depending on the day part. So this is the morning drive, which is where you get the biggest audience, you get the most uh, people listening, and the best ad sales. And then over here in the evening, um, things are different. So the clock itself will change depending on the day part. Uh, and um, Let's see, the clock is divided up into kind of categories without specifics. So uh, on the morning drive, you'll have the station ID, which legally has to be given at the top of the hour. Uh, and then three music cuts, um, with including sweeper, liner promo. So those are little audio elements that come in between the songs. Then they'll do traffic at about 10 past 8. And then they'll do three commercials and then come in with a promo at 8.15, and then they pick it up. So that's how to read this. Now, uh, the music director, if there is one, or the program director, will be deciding you know, how this is laid out. And uh, I don't know if you, if you do drive to work or to school, and you leave every day at the same hour, you'll very quickly realize, OK, this station plays you know, like 
10, 10 advertisements in a row. I don't want to be there. So, so you can feel the consistency of the clock. They will change the music that goes in there, you know, uh, but the, the, the layout of the hour will be the same. So the clock is like a template. And it is designed to use your program elements as effectively as you can. Um, and there's a little bit of logic to the clock as well, given that uh, they are thinking about uh, what the audience is doing at any particular moment. Uh, a lot of people start work at 8.30 or some fewer at 9. Um, so they may uh, program um, music strategically because they know that everybody changes the channel when they hear too many commercials. And so they pick the times strategically when they're going to want to have uh, music. And the other thing that they do is they know that they are rating. The ratings happen every quarter hour. It's called AQH, average quarter hour. So in each 15 minute segment, they want to maximize the number of listeners that are there. And so you notice that they'll start off with music at the top of each segment, at least in these two going down. It doesn't say exactly what time it's for, but here, here again, it's pretty consistent. They're going to make sure that, you know, if you are joining them immediately after 8 a.m., there's going to be enough music in there to keep you listening for the requisite, I think it's two minutes that you have to be in order to be counted. And they're going to do that again here, right? So um, they're, they're trying to make sure you stay with them long enough in each rated quarter hour segment to appear in their ratings. Get Legacy? Um, back home, where I'm from, I'm from Detroit, they have a couple different radio stations. They um, sometimes advertise, uh, coming up is a commercial free hour, mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, yeah. Good point. So commercial free hour is something that the, a lot of stations are doing in order to, again, build up their ratings over that period of time. Um, and the other thing that you're talking about is, you know, the, the liner promo is what you're talking about, which is they're going to, uh, you know, uh, announce, the announce something that's coming up, right? Uh, we'll have a new song for you or we'll have a competition for you or something. They'll do it around here, and if they're, you know, you'll, you'll see some stations uh, pitch, you know, you could win $1,000 coming up in our competition, and they'll say it here in this segment, they'll say it here in this segment, and then maybe they'll actually do the thing in this segment. So they're trying to keep you listening through each segment until you get to that competition or whatever it is, ticket giveaway or, you know, new song. Uh, or even a highly rated, you know, uh, industry, uh, you know, like gossip news or something, they'll save those. Yeah, legacy? So essentially it's like um, if you're riding a horse and you're trying to get it to move, carrot on the stick? Yeah, right, that's the carrot, right? Yeah. yeah. But the, the logic, now that we know how this clock works, the logic is based on ratings, for sure, and also an awareness of what your audience is doing. If they're going to work at 8.30, a lot of them are, you know, getting out of the car, stopped or whatever. There's not a lot of people who are going to be listening here compared maybe to here. And same thing, especially up around night. So these are kind of dead periods. And where do you think they wind up putting commercials? You know, they put them in those places because they know that the commercials make people run away. So they're going to stick them as like, okay, if you get to work at 830, you're already parked and gone. You're not listening to radio. So we'll stick them in there. But if you're going to work for 8.30, you probably want to hear music, you know, based on the average commute time. All of this is, is figured out, basically, by, uh, you know, uh, this is basic use of the clock in scheduling. Um, so as for the music, you know, we've heard about rotation, right? So rotation refers to how often you play the same songs. And uh, so um, there are categories of music that are used. Like there's, there's, for instance, gold, as you can imagine, older songs, older hits that people still respond well to. Uh, and there's several other categories. And so if you are in a you know, CHR, contemporary hit pop, pop CHR, you know you hear those same songs over and over again, right? So yeah, absolutely. So those, those would be heavy rotation. And you know, their clock would be set up with a lot of spots reserved for those particular songs, which you know, 
you'd only have 20 or 30 of them at a time in your database and so it would shuffle them you know quite often versus the, the gold is your back catalog of maybe 200 250 songs you know, again you probably have all heard you know there's one song by one group that they play you know that's the logic of gold is that they will play the one song by the group that everybody knows, Bohemian Rhapsody or, you know, We Will Rock You or something like that. And, and that'll, you know, that'll be the, the song from Queen that they play. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that, that's the story about rotation and, and how it works with the hot clock and stuff. You notice at night, uh, there's way less variety, no traffic, there's a lot of music and commercials basically. Um, so some of the other stuff that comes in that you, uh, during a morning drive, you won't hear that at night. And uh, you make significantly less money av uh, from your ads at night based on that. So that's um, radio programming, um, quick version that we got. Um, let's now, you know, get into sort of what's, what's going on in um, contemporary TV programming. Um, so maybe we should talk, what should we talk about? Uh, well, we've been talking about broadcast, so before we get into cable, let's, let's go to broadcast. Um, and let's just... Scheduling, okay, we want to get into scheduling for sure. Um, okay, where this stuff comes from. So we're into television programming and what you see on TV. And also, I mean, this, this counts for radio too, so I guess it's a good topic. Good topic for a, a segue. Uh, and now, this was my good pen, I guess, right? Right, uh, something called syndication. So if you listen to co commercial radio on Saturday, you may hear, uh, you know, America's Top 40, or you may hear, uh, what are some of these? We've got House of Blues in the Bay Area, you'll hear that. So um, television and radio programs come, you know, they usually originate, well, they originate in two, a few places. You can get them from the network. You can get them from a local station. Or you can get them from a syndicator. That's basically it. So, you know, like a network will produce, uh, you know, through, through the production studios that most of them now control. It wasn't always like that. You know, they could, they could buy from a bunch of different sources. But now it's pretty much integrated. So, you know, if ABC wants more modern family, they'll produce more modern family. Local stations also produce stuff, um, but, it, you know, they don't have the kind of money necessary to produce a sitcom or something. So these will typically be like uh, talk shows or, um, you know, public affairs type of thing. And, of course, the big one is news. That's where, you know, they pour a lot of money. So your local station programming would be that. The syndicator uh, does a couple of different things. Um, they produce original shows. So, and a lot of these were kind of like midday staples, like Dr. Phil, um, all the game shows, or not all of them, but I think most of the game shows, the, especially the ones that are more like Jeopardy and things like that, like the old school types of game shows, those are uh, original syndicated shows, and they do some dramas, comedies, and stuff. Um, and they will also do what's called off-network. And that is, you know, shows that were, well, let's just do them by genre, right? I mean, dramas, sitcoms, etc., right? originated by the network, but when they come into reruns, those are officially called off-network shows uh, because they started on a network and now you can see them off the network. So the way that works is if you're at a local station, you have a certain number of hours a day that are not filled up by the network that you're affiliated with. 
uh, and you need to fill them, let's say after 11 p.m. or something like that, you go to a syndicator and you buy off-network shows that you can show in, in those time periods. Um, so uh, um, that kind of explains that. And in radio syndicated shows, you'll typically hear them on the weekend and stuff where they don't want to have to pay staff, even any kind of DJ or, or announcer. So they'll get a, a syndicated show, which is, you know, pre-recorded and it's uh, yeah, America's Top 40 with a celebrity host and, and you know it's sold all over the country. Um, so the syndicator, syndication means that a show that might have started on CBS, you could now hear it on a local affiliate and a local NBC affiliate you could watch it like but only at like 11 o'clock or night or something like that as a, as a rerun or something. Um, and now of course uh, a lot of uh, <laughs> this used to be like, you know, a pretty big part of the business, but it wasn't as huge as it is now because those off-network shows are going to, you know, uh, Netflix or whatever. And if it's Friends or if it's Seinfeld or something like that, they're literally making, you know, a million dollars an episode uh, for streaming rights. And so they have become, in, you know, off-network shows are incredibly valuable now. And uh, so... That's, so this is where, where shows come from. Yeah. So maybe you shouldn't put that up there, but rather <laughs> sources. Sources of shows. Don't, um, don't networks or um, companies sometimes uh, use focus groups to like, get people's opinions before they decide to air shows? Um, they certainly do regarding like creating shows, you know, pilots and stuff like that. There's a, a lot of, of testing of pilots and things as they decide. And Amazon was even kind of uh, throwing that whole process open. You know, they had Amazon Studios and they would present like a lot of pilot pitches in written form and ask, you know, the Amazon Prime members or whoever, what do you think? And then they'd pilot some of them, and they would actually show the pilots. You could watch them and vote on them. It's I would definitely imagine that's a cool idea for like shows that are like original content, like on Netflix. Uh, I would I would bet they do that. I don't know. You know, they're kind of they're kind of known for because uh, um, I mean Netflix makes an order without a pilot season. So uh, you know the way the networks. This is kind of becoming history, but it still happens on ABC, CBS, NBC. They have a pilot season, right? They, they show all the pilots for the, in the fall, in September, August, late August, early September. And, you know, within three, four weeks, a bunch of them are canceled because they don't find an audience despite all the focus grouping and everything. And then the rest of them continue, and they actually have a second round of shows to plug into all the canceled spots. Um, versus Netflix, basically a lot of people like working with Netflix because they'll make an order for a whole season and that's it. You know? And, and they're, they're not going to cancel a show because it doesn't stream well. They'll just dump it for binge watching. You know? And you can, if, if you don't like those 13 seasons, 13 episodes they put up, they won't make another order. But in broadcasting, it literally was, you know, they would, they would cancel your show after four episodes and you were done, you know, and you had to go look for another job. So a lot of people find the Netflix uh, model of making an order based on the original thing a little more humane and a little bit more balanced. You know? There's been a lot of criticism of network TV for being too swift to cancel and not really investing in shows to let people find the show. It's, it's like... If you missed it in the first three weeks, it's gone. Fox. You know? Yeah, Fox. Yeah, well, and, and fa yeah, and and uh, I think it's Kevin Riley was an executive there who left uh, a few years back. But he was talking about, yeah, Fox should not do not do pilots anymore. Fox should, Fox should make full season orders. Like, but he left, so I don't know. But um, he's yeah, I don't know what their actual philosophy is now. Um, so where we want to go for this here, uh, stuff, stuff, stuff. Wow, OK, yeah. We're going to focus in then on um, primetime programming. So uh, part of 
television scheduling and radio in its day as well has also been uh, um, organized around what are called day parts. And uh, this, again, is a product of the broadcaster thinking, well, what is my audience doing? Uh, in different parts of the day, they're either at work or they may be at home relaxing or they'll be asleep. Uh, and, you know, in radio, that determines, you know, the morning drive is the best day part for radio because most of the people are in their car and that's where radio really still has an edge. Um, in terms of uh, broadcast TV, uh, you know, we all know about prime time, which is your uh, most expensive day part in television, right? Uh, versus early morning. I mean, there are, there's definitely a type of show that is created for that with the idea that the audience is, you know, probably domestic, people staying at home. Uh, they have it on in the background. They want, you know, sort of pleasant chit chat and a lot of people promoting a lot of stuff and kind of goofy stories and things, but they're not going to program incredibly expensive dramas and comedies at that time because the audience is not that big. So, um, yeah, primetime uh, usually runs from 8 to 11 p.m. Uh, and there's also a brief period, 7 to 8, uh, called prime access. They may be calling it something a little bit different. And this, we might have mentioned last class or class before, uh, um, the FCC actually carved this out historically at some point because uh, they wanted to leave uh, local stations time in what they called prime time at that point to actually program some of their local stuff. It was usually news. So otherwise, the big networks wanted to eat all the time up, the most profitable time. Uh, and, and so this is uh, uh, left to the uh, local station. Usually they'll put news, but they may also use some syndicated programming in there if it does well for them as well. And in fact, if they're like an NBC affiliate, and, you know, there's a big NBC show that runs from 8 till 9. They could also put reruns of that show from 7 till 8 and probably do pretty well there. So 8 to 11 p.m. is typically prime time. But if uh, we're talking about Fox or the CW, it's actually 8 to 10 p.m., right? They still, as far as I know, they don't go 10 to 11. And most of the Fox affiliates put their uh, news on at 10 at that point. So... Uh, that's another indication of the smaller network with a particular strategy. They don't do a full prime time period. So that relates to the essay topic that we talked about, right? Um, <clears throat> so where are we at here? Prime time, the mainstay of the TV industry for sure. Um, okay, and we should mention those cable networks now. Uh, so, you know, cable obviously was uh, created, uh, the reason for cable was that some people had bad reception because they lived behind a mountain or they lived too far from, uh, you know, a broadcast antenna. So starting in the 1950s, the cable industry uh, was basically built out of, you know, like this is a real entrepreneur's story because, uh, you know, it was people in hardware stores that sold TVs. And wow, the TV looked great in the hardware store, but when people got it home, the reception sucked. And so they said, well, uh, you know, what can you do for me? And they say, well, we'll run a little wire from the antenna over to your house. Uh, and so, uh, you know, talk about a small business turning into a big business. From that, you know, eventually, pretty soon after, you had entrepreneurs who would drive around, you know, from one community to another with the necessary hardware in their car. And they would go from like one house to another, say, you know, I can get you better TV reception. Uh, just pay me some money and I'll hook you up. And so they literally did this. And eventually that grew into larger regional businesses and now into like gigantic Comcast size cable, cable operators. Uh, they call them MSOs, multi-system operators. When we get to business, we do talk about that. Um, so that was the whole growth of that business based on simply rebroadcasting uh, existing television. But eventually in the 1980s with HBO and with MTV, those are two big, big startups in this field, 
they realize, yeah, we can do original programming. We don't just recycle, uh, you know, rebroadcast what's on ABC, CBS, NBC. We can open that up. And uh, um, Congress uh, originally, you know, they're always intent on protecting the interests of existing broadcast systems. We've seen that in radio. Um, it happened in television as cable came on. They created certain rules. There was a limited number of channels that you could put onto your cable system. Uh, you had to first carry all of the major uh, networks in their from their local channel before you could add others. So in other words, what that was intended to do was, if we were in San Francisco, our cable company had to, you know, put the KGO on ABC affiliate here. They couldn't go and get an ABC affiliate from Los Angeles and put it on, you know, strike a better deal with them and put it on. The idea was that you didn't want the cable system to cut out the local station. So that was a rule that they made. You had to have all of the major local stations on your cable system. Then they limited the number of original channels that you could have and so on. So eventually they took those restrictions off as they saw that you know terrestrial television could cope with cable. But there is still the must carry rule where they must carry the local affiliates. But they opened up to limitless number of cable channels, literally into the hundreds. And uh, so these are your Bravos, you know, all uh, your, your National Geographic channel, your, uh, you know, that's just, there's endless, there's tons and tons of them. Um, which when we talk business, we'll see that they have their challenges, you know, it's, uh, cable is declining just like broadcasting is declining and stuff. Um, so cable was arranged, you know, ordered into tiers, T-I-E-R-S. And uh, uh, you got your basic cable, and uh, you got various tiers, tiers of programming, right? Tier one, tier two. You got your pay-per-view, which for a while was very profitable. You could get, you know, sporting events or uh, uh, um, movies as well on pay-per-view. And uh, if you were a cable operator, you could also, you know, uh, sell advertising. So. Uh, it was, it's actually still a very profitable business in that way. There are many ways that they can make money versus a local, normal local television station can only make money by selling advertising. So cable's a good business for that. Um, although it's, it's, a, it's a hated business and a lot of people would love to get <laughs> out of cable. <laughs> All right. Oh my gosh. So now. One more big thing that uh, is kind of it's kind of fun and uh, um, is talking about uh, how broadcast networks um, schedule their shows to try to uh, well to compete with one another in prime time. Um, so we're talking prime time. TV scheduling, right? So if we are talking prime time, there is no prime time in radio. So by, by definition, prime time is in TV. Um, prime time TV scheduling. So I have here a little, a little relatively current. Uh, this, should, this should be faster to find this. Let's see here. Uh, not an assignments modules, thank you. There we go. Down to ratings examples. Yeah, so here we go. Let's just look at one of these reports. It's getting old now, too. Uh, Daily Variety, which published these reports, uh, stopped publishing a few years back. Um, but you can you can find some of this information, just not in quite as as nicely laid out a format, basically. Um, so, um, what we're looking at here is uh, uh, you know each of the networks what they were programming on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. There's ABC, there's CBS, there's NBC, there's Fox, 
Um, the CW is over there as well and stuff. But what's interesting is to look at what, you know, how they compete with one another. So if we're looking at Monday night, uh, here's the average rating that they got for the night was 15, uh, a, a rating of 15, which means 15% of households uh, were tuned in, right? And so uh, ABC takes uh, Monday night with Dancing with the Stars. And look at this. Um, uh, NBC programs The Voice in, you know, opposition to it. So two of the same type of show on the same night, right? You're going to have probably similar types of audience watching. People uh, probably switch between channels. So it's po well, yeah, that's always, they always worry about it. But also just, you know, let's say that you're not into reality competition. What are your options? What's CBS doing? Uh, two broke girls, two and a half men, Mike and Molly. That looks like a string of comedies, basically. So maybe you prefer comedy to reality competition. Or maybe you prefer, you know, kind of detective or medical drama, then you go to Fox. Rick? Um, how relevant is the competing against each other now? Because if there are two shows on that I want to watch, I'll DVR one. Right, and yeah. Watch one live and watch yeah. the other. Well, it's still, you know, they'll still do it, but it is less, as you say, it's less crucial, put it that way, because you can always, you can always, you know, catch up later. Uh, but they still do this quite seriously because to the advertiser, the live audience is still the most important. Although they will count the DVR audience as well. But, um, you know, in terms of network sales and stuff, the, the advertisers are still looking for big live audiences. It's a great question, though. Um, so there are uh, some um, industry terms that you'll still see used here, and actually you'll see them used uh, by the industry to talk about competition between one service and another even. Uh, but one thing that uh, came up already in one of the little video we've been using the word is counter-programming, right? And so this is where you look at what the, uh, um, you look at what the uh, competition is doing and you do something else. So if they're doing, uh, um, you know, reality competition, you do comedy or you do drama. If they're doing comedy, you're not going to compete with them, so you're going to do drama, right? Uh, Thursday nights, again, CBS did well. Uh, for a while, NBC used to have, you know, the best Thursday nights in, uh, in comedy. Um, Friends, when Friends was on and stuff like that. So they try to sort of stake out uh, uh, time periods where they're showing something that will bring to them a particular audience, right? Just the way those radio stations, you know, knew the demographics that they would attract with their shows. We're seeing the same thing here, you know, trying to differentiate between what the other people are doing so that you can, you know, bring in your set of advertisers. That's, that's basically what's going on with this. How, yeah, Rick? How programming is also, um, could be used well, I mean, the Super Bowl just happened. Yes. And they know everyone don't watch the Super Bowl, so there's something called Puppy Bowl. <laughs> oh, is that right? Oh, I didn't know that. that. Um, okay. And every time. And that's a cable to, channel, right? And yeah, every time they go to commercial on like uh, the Super Bowl, they'll uh -huh. start the next segment on the Puppy Bowl challenge. It's just like. I love it. Yeah. That is so funny. No, I didn't know about that at all. That is so cool. Humor, humor. That is so cool, and it's also demonstrating that. You know, these concepts don't just work within network television, but also in the relationship of one service to another. That is really funny, the puppy bowl. I'm going to have to learn more about that. So that's counter-programming. Head-to-head uh, -head programming is, is when you do, I won't, I won't continue to write these up, but head-to-head -head programming is what we said, where, you know, Dancing with the Stars goes up against The Voice, basically. And one of them is going to lose and they have similar, they have similar uh, audiences. And so it is, you know, it is a strategy that um, uh, it's a little more dangerous to play because you clearly come out the loser at that point. Um, what else have we got? Okay, tent pulling and hammocking. So these are, these are uh, uh, very intuitive categories. That's why I like these. So tent pulling means, uh, well, that's hammocking, right? It looks like a hammock. A tent pole, let's start with that. Uh, it looks like that, and a hammock looks sort of like, you know, 
between two trees, right? Mm -hmm. So tent poling, you'll also hear uh, people in the industry talking about this more generally, but in our specific example, it means putting a highly rated show between two lesser rated shows. And the idea is you're gonna pull up the ratings on these shows that are around it by, uh, you know, with the power of that highly rated show. So I don't know if we can see in here some examples of um, what we're basically looking at is within uh, the channel uh, on a particular night, we're looking for you know a highly rated show that is propping up some others around it. So um, here might be an example, okay? And and if you guys care to look at anything other than your phones, you could also participate. But you know I, I can run my show this way too. So Dancing with the Stars has a 13.71, which is pretty high. It's almost as as high as the actual competition the night before. And it really is, you know, head and shoulders above everything else that's on Tuesday night on, uh, what is that? That's ABC, I guess. So, you know, so that would be obviously an example of temple, like 13.71 versus, you know, five and five around there. So the idea is that, you know, it, this is going to prop things up. And, uh, um, the, the other thing is just, again, to speak specifically about ratings, you know, if people tune in because they don't want to miss the beginning of Dancing with the Stars because maybe, the, you know, they know that there's a big splashy, splashy production number or something that they want to catch, they might tune in at 825, you know, and then they'll get counted as part of the audience for Cougar Town. So uh, this, you know, quite practically, you, you know, you, you may also have, you know, someone an audience who, you know, actually likes Cougar Town and discovers it that way, you know, that, that's another strategy that they use. So that's tent polling, hammocking. So what, based on the picture, what do you think hammocking is? Putting a lower rated show between two something? Yes, yeah, so, so sticking a lower rated show in between two highly rated shows to prop up the lower rated show. And this is often a technique used, you know, if you have a comedy block and maybe, eh, we can't see it too well. Let's see here. Yeah, here we go. Uh, we're, we're seeing this on uh, CBS on Thursday night. Okay, Big Bang Theory has, you know, it's about to go off the air, but it's been a huge sitcom for them for years and years. So there's a good example of hammocking. Big Bang Theory, person of interest rating almost as highly as Big Bang Theory and propping up something in the middle called rules of engagement. Which, uh, but you can see by the numbers that it's basically two highly rated shows holding up something in the middle. So that would be an example of, of hammocking there. It's like balancing it out. Yeah, and again, you know, here's like, oh, I love comedy and I really like Big Bang Theory. So they're going to put that first thing of the night and then they're hoping you'll just settle in and watch yeah. you know, a, a few comedies in a row without changing the channel, you know. Then they'll switch it up with The Mentalist, which, you know, is still rating pretty well for them. So were they, uh, yeah, they won the night with 12% of the audience, you know. So, yeah, so that's hammocking. Uh, so like I said, these are fun because they, they kind of make sense and they're really easy to remember just by, you know, uh, the, the the picture that the, the, the concept draws in your mind, you know. So leading in uh, is more common than leading out, but both of them means uh, they mean um, putting a uh, putting a uh, putting a top show at the beginning of the night, so that uh, whatever comes afterwards um, leads is, is 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 basically propped up. You you get your audience to come in for Dancing with the Stars, and they'll probably stick around for Castle. That's what they hope. So, so that's leading in. Um, and uh, what's another important one? Blocking. Uh, OK, so blocking means programming stuff in a block. Similar shows in a block. So you know, a comedy block would be you know, one at 8, one at 8.30, one at 9. So you can see CBS and um, 
NBC trying this out actually on the same night, Thursday night. So, uh, um, yeah, NBC certainly didn't do well, but for <laughs> a lot of critically acclaimed shows here, Community, 30 Rock, The Office, which used to rate very well, and Parks and Recreation, they're all rated pretty low. Uh, but they are, you know, they were very critically appreciated sitcoms and stuff versus CBS had, you know, the Big Bang Theory basically there. So, um, but this is a good example of one, two, three, four comedies in a row. And that's called block programming. Okay. So that's, this is a block. And we're not going to have time to play a Kahoot tonight, today. I mean, we can do it next class. The other one is called stripping. So here, it, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, let's say at 11 p.m., you strip program, you know, something. Uh, it's very often syndicated stuff, like uh, reruns of, uh, of sitcoms and stuff. So we wouldn't see that with um, network primetime programming because they don't have enough of any show to strip it five nights a week. But uh, let's just see if one of the others did this. I have a question. Can't see it. Yeah. So we don't have an example of stripping, but it would be like every night of the week at 11 a show. Yeah, Some Legacy. Some of the shows on CW they are separate shows, but sometimes they intertwine. Uh huh. Uh huh. So like you have to watch both shows or oh, all three shows. Interesting. To watch all to understand it. That's a smart idea too. Yeah, yeah. So, you you know, and CSI used to do that. You get the people from Miami going to Chicago or whatever, and they'd have those those special episodes and stuff. They have crossover episodes too that air like twice or once a year, I think where like all of the heroes from like all different shows are like in one giant episode. And it's like that on each different show. Interesting, yeah. interesting. So it's a little bit of the extended universe. Uh, yeah. Model, you know? Actually, a lot of people talking about those superhero movies as taking on a television type aspects, you know, where these things link up. But yeah, great example. Yeah, that, get, that gets people interested in those particular episodes coming back. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And but very entertaining as well, you know. That's the other thing. Well now let's take a look just uh, I want to make sure that um, even if we don't do the Kahoot that we've covered the key concepts. Um, so we talked for radio programming, hot clocks, rotation. Uh, okay, so commercial versus underwriting support. This, you know, quite simply is uh, if you are a uh, public radio station, you've got corporate underwriters and you've got your subscribers, you know, giving you money uh, versus, um, you know, your regular types of programming, which is supported by commercials. Um, otherwise, we've talked about network programming strategies, tent pulling, hammocking, blocking, bridging. Bridging um, is when uh, the shows no longer end on the half hour. Uh, consistently they will you know um, one show will end and there won't be a burst of commercials the next show will begin right away with the idea that we if we catch you like that we don't give you the chance to go out and get a beer or something you'll stick with the next show so bridging refers to like and the minute one show ends the next one begins and then they'll mix the commercials in some other way so bridging is sometimes is start the next show starting? Sorry, uh, I don't know who to go with first. Rick first. Uh, okay, Kira first. Like marathoning. Uh, marathoning would be putting on, you know, on a cable channel, putting on oh. many, many reruns in a row, basically, oh. right? Like marathoning Family Guy or marathoning, you know, Shark, the Shark oh, Week or whatever, or South Park. Yeah. So for that, you need like literally hundreds of episodes. So that's usually off network. You do a deal with a syndicator and you get like everything and you show it all at once. That's marathoning. But Rick, what did you want to say? I was going to say sometimes they even start the show before the credits start, like the, do a split screen. Right, yeah. The credits start running and start the next show. Yes, that's in there. definitely example of bridging. Definitely example of bridging. So we talked about sourcing, network, off network, syndicated, original syndicated, which would be like Dr. Phil or Oprah was in her day. 
where a private company just makes the shows and sells it directly to local stations without a network involved. So that'd be original syndicated. And then uh, this stuff we talked about last class. So we did manage to cover it all. Sorry, there wasn't much time for chat today. We kind of had to just power through all of this uh, stuff. Um, so we'll, we'll do the Kahoot next week. Uh, and um, I'll work on getting that uh, quiz, uh, um, the page with the, I told you, you could review using challenges from the Kahoots. So I can get that up before can the weekend. Can you do that? Can you do that thing where you send like an email to everyone? Sure. So, so it's up there? Yep. Sure. Gracias. Yeah. I can do that before before the weekend. I'm kind of glad the Kahoot didn't work today because the Wi-Fi is not working. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that would have sucked. Like, okay, good. Well, good to hear. Okay, guys, have a good uh, Valentine's Day and good weekend and stuff.